The title of my talk, The Poetics of Form, Analyzing Post-Post-9-11 Critical Texts, is about that very tension of trying to do both the political and to be precise about form, and in some ways also to practice things that we learn in narratology and classic philology, of being very careful in our textual analysis and seeing what that tells us about text. An overview of my talk is as follows. I first want to talk about the seeming tension between narrowly definitional, narratological, we could call that form-related scholarship and political analysis. I then want to talk about how it might be possible to work towards a political understanding of form-related analysis using intermedial narratology and other form or formalist means. And in order to demonstrate what I'm doing, so this isn't entirely form, I'm going to use examples of two what I call post-post 9-11 texts and their politicized use of unreliable narration. And then to go on to a further point to say that this formal analysis or an awareness of the unreliable narration in both of these texts, Moshin Hamid's The Reluctant Fundamentalist and Homeland, points to a potential critique that we could have of a staple of literary studies, which is the unreliable narrator and the unreliable narration concepts and to look at the concepts that underlie that idea of unreliability and also some of the power arrangements that may be implicit in them. And my point is, and to tell you where I'm going from the beginning, is that I believe that the analysis of the politics of form can provide us with an avenue for not making moralistic or simply um, moralistic judgments about text or simply reading them as reflections of extratextual reality. So the tension between narrowly definitional narratological scholarship and political analysis. This begins with positioning myself. I am of a generation of scholars that believes in situated criticism that it is particular that I am an expatriate American, that I have a bicultural status, that I am white, that I am middle-aged, et cetera, et cetera, left-leaning in my political sensibilities. All of these, that I'm tall, all of these factors play into and relate to the way I look at texts. So this tension that I'm describing, and this talk is close to my heart, reflects on two kinds of scholarship that I'm doing, and you've heard I'm very eclectic, or I don't know where I'm going, or I still haven't grown up. And part of that is about, I was trained by an extremely skilled narratologist in Germany. And one of the reasons that I think I was chosen for a professorship in, in Gießen was because of my narratological credentials. And that in some of my work, I'm doing very specific narratological close analysis of texts, which involves definitional and, and very, very small definitional differences and trying to get it just, just right, what we're talking about, both a phenomena in a text and its function, and then seeing if we can universalize that to the degree or not. So I'm doing that kind of work. And then I'm also doing very political forms of work. I'm looking at particularly dominant representations of the attacks of September 11th, 2001, and of the Obama's first presidency, and of the election of Obama in uh, 2012, and looking at the ideological commitments of dominant representations. And what I find is sometimes very different is bringing together that definitional work, that close analysis, and that interest in the political, and also seeing the political as an aesthetic process in itself. And to talk about these two differences, if I go to a conference on narratology, I will next week, um, I might more typically see two passionate scholars dis describing with all, and, and really yelling at each other because they care about it, um, whether we can still use Jeanette's extra diegetic terminology or not. 
And at a different kind of conference, we'll be getting down, we'll be duking it out about the politics of attack ads, for instance, in the 2012 presidential election from the United States. So what I'm trying to do is to bring those two kinds of interests together. I believe that by paying attention to form, we can perform a kind of political critique that evolves, um, that, that um, will get us away from some stop gaps of some kinds of critical analysis that can be moralistic in how it looks at the political. And what I'm trying to do in a larger sense is take the narrow out of narratology. Narratology, the science of narratives, of storytelling. And this narrow narratology, we're here in the German context, comes from a dear colleague and friend, Ansgar Nuning, again, another preeminent narratologist, who told me about a seminar in which one of his German students wrote about narratology as narrotology. In other words, that uh, uh, Freud less Grusen, that extremely narrow interest in form. And when you talk to some people about narratology, that's what they see. That's just about definitions. That's just about Stanzel versus Jeanette uh, versus the Russian formalists, et cetera, et cetera. My examples in order to talk about how form can actually be performing a form of an aesthetic text, be performing a kind of politics, are come from what I call two post-post 9-11 square quotes texts and their politicized use of unreliable narration. The scare quotes are there because uh, I try to avoid the term 9-11. It has been used, I believe, as a way of remembering and memorializing the attacks of September 11th, 2001 in quite political ways. Moreover, it is not the only 9-11 in history. South American scholars are quick to remind us. Hence, I use it so that people will know what I'm talking about it, but I want to bracket it just to say we need to be careful of that, that we're not perpetuating a kind of narrative about those attacks of now uh, almost uh, 12 years ago when we use that term. And by post, post 9-11, I'm suggesting a different sensibility than the one that followed in dominant representations of texts that followed right after those September attacks. So, what am I talking about when I talk about characteristics of post-9-11 texts, what these post-post texts are reacting to? In the first uh, instance, they're characterized by punitive attitudes they express towards putative terrorists. And by pu uh, punitive, I mean the idea that those who are suspected of terrorism should be punished. Any idea of rehabilitative justice, of, of uh, agreement, of the possibility of coming into conversation is lost there. There is a sense that um, hurting terrorists and using a kind of retributive justice towards them is justified. I would argue that post 9-11 texts support the curtailing of human rights that we witnessed in the United States after the September 11th attacks. And I'm covering well-known ground for many of you. That included the Patriot Act, which severely, and we sometimes forget this in uh, US American studies, severely curtailed the civil liberties of US Americans by allowing um, access to email and telephones without getting a warrant beforehand, and also access to financial records. The use of secret internment centers for terrorist suspects, also known as enemy combatants, as a way to get around the Geneva agreements about how to deal with prisoners or black sites. The use of extra-legal rendition, which is the arresting or uh, taking someone into prison without habeas corpus, without telling him or her why it is that she is being detained, and so-called enhanced interrogation techniques or um, more commonly known as torture in Bagram, Abu Ghraib, and in Guat Guatemala Bay. Uh, 
Um, other characteristics that we know from dominant representations are, can be found in the idealization, and this extends to images of gender and to images of race, arguably also to class in the US American context. Uh, the idealization of hypermasculine US American men, picturing them as defenders of a feminized homeland, significantly the uh, Homeland Security Office was opened very quickly after the attacks, and seemingly defenseless Arab women who were in need of the protection of um, US, masculinized US American power. Further, I believe, and I'm quoting the scholarship of many others, this is not my original contribution, there was a distribution of traditional forms of US American prejudice, particularly towards African Americans, onto what has been called anti-Arab racism. Now, anti-Arab racism is a term that I think is helpful instead of Islamophobia, uh, people who are, are um, Muslim, or in term, instead of um, Orientalism, because it includes also the perceptions of people who could be Arab or could be Muslim. And as you know, there were many attacks on people that appeared to be Arab after the September attacks of 2001, not just those who were, actually. Um, you'll notice here that I'm not differentiating between fictional and non-fictional texts. This is another discourse, but it is my belief that fictionality and non-fictionality exist along a spectrum and that we can talk about narrative or what we used to call aesthetic or literary qualities in both kinds of texts. This is the uh, memorial issue of Newsweek a very, very widely read American um, weekly 10 years after the September 11th attacks, 2011. And I would argue the plane appearing out of the right sand of the sky and here with these piled up words, uh, 10 years of fear, grief, revenge, resilience as a kind of empty signifier of where the towers were, that this is suggesting visually a narrative of the attacks came out of nowhere, like a lot of 9-11 timelines, that there was no history before them, that there was absolutely no provocation, there was no historical reason, there were no um, infringements by the US or acts in Afghanistan and Pakistan, for instance, that led to strong feelings about the United States. It belongs to, I believe, dominant representations of 9-11, and here still years after, uh, 10 years after the event, which emphasize how the attacks demonstrated the United States' exceptional position in global politics and its refusal to give in to enemies. Quoting Bush uh, shortly after the attacks, America was targeted for attack because we're the brightest beacon for freedom and opportunity in the world and no one will keep that light from shining. This is cueing in, referring to a history of US American exceptionalism that goes back to Winthrop with his idea of America as a city on the hill that will show other nations how to be better. And it's continuing that idea. And the big word here is resilience, the pluck of Americans, they're sticking together despite this attack that came out of nowhere, was ahistorical and without context. I have argued elsewhere that dominant and normative representations of the attacks and their aftermath impose codes about what could and could not be said about the attacks. That's very often a concentration on the towers and not the other parts of the attacks and the uh, towers um, falling at ground zero, the elision of dead bodies, dead American bodies, except in very specific contexts and in very, very specific, arguably iconic photographs like The Falling Man by Drew. They feature first person homodiegetic tales of loss and suffering that elicit feelings of vulnerability, a sense of empathy for the teller, and a sense of the incredible loss 
Uh, they emphasize the heroism of the firefighters and other first responders with a resultant emphasis on U.S. American sacrifice, heroism, and unity. You'll remember that a photograph of firemen lifting the flags at the scene of Ground Zero went back to a very famous photograph of World War II soldiers raising the flag. And it was subsequently turned into a memorial for firefighters. They present the attacks as an act of war so horrific that immediate military retaliation was not only justified but necessary. I'm quoting David Kellner here. Leading to a support of aggressive U.S. governmental policies after the attacks. Subsequently, and again, this is a well-known story, there was a critique of the American media for colluding with dominant political messages and not being careful enough about, for instance, uh, the alleged um, weapons of mass destruction, uh, destruction in Iraq. Uh, we're missing the image, which should be Jack Bauer in trans bringing over the um, well, we may be without images, but we'll live without it. Um, imagine, if you will, who knows 24 here? OK. Um, 24, a fo uh, not insignificantly, a very, very popular Fox season uh, that played between 2001 and 2010 and started actually before the attacks. Um, it became enormously popular afterwards. In the image which I had here, we had Jack Bauer, who leads a counter-terrorist unit, holding out a gun with a White House behind him and a clicking talk clock in the middle. And this counter-terrorist unit and Jack Bauer, whose motto was to do whatever it takes, continuously stressed the omnipresence of terrorist threats within the United States, the need to use extra legal means in order to uh, combat them, and particularly the need to torture terrorist suspects in order, for instance, to save 8 million people in Los Angeles from blowing up in a nuclear bomb. So here we do have an image. Um, 24 was a big deal, not least of all because of its formal qualities, the use of split screens, up to six to eight split screens working at the same time. Um, the use of real time, each episode represented an hour, time elapsed, discourse time and story time were the same. If there was a commercial break, then the time went forward. And you had a constantly clicking digital clock to remind you of the eminence both of danger and the omnipresence of time and the danger of time. The use of real-time action, split screens, and the race against the ticking clock suggested the imminence of terrorist danger, a constant threat that had to be combated with, um, I'm assuming what I was going to say, extrajudicial means, including torture. Jack tortures a lot of people. <coughs> Here we have him, and again, in bringing over the PowerPoint onto this image, there was some messing up. We have Jack here um, about to hurt a terrorist suspect. The series suggested that only a Jack Bauer, who is pictured on the right, could save the United States from terrorist attacks and jihadists operating um, inside and, out and outside the United States by working outside the law to obtain information. Um, arguably, the show very powerfully offered a sense of containment by constantly demonstrating terrorist scenarios that were even worse than the one that the United States had just witnessed. And that was part of its logic and part of the closure that it um, provided. It worked, and let me say one more thing, through ticking bomb scenarios. And if you're not familiar with this, uh, we have an instant of it in not too long ago in German history with Jakob Metze, uh, is the idea that if someone is not tortured now, then a horrible, horrible result will happen. And using a kind of perverted utilitarian logic of for, it's for the greater good to hurt this one individual in order to save millions of people. 
Uh, very oddly and uh, against all evidence, uh, torture is always successful in 24, and it always happens very quickly. It became a best-loved shows of officers in training at, for instance, West Point, and Solis, along with other legal instructors, complained that it was very difficult to explain to men about to go out to Iraq uh, how they could interrogate a suspect or a detainee when they would say, but what about Jack Bauer? And it always works. This was a view shared not only by young men and women going into the military, it was also shared by Scalia. At a law conference, he said no one would convict um, Jack Bauer, a chief then chief, a chief, chief justice on the Supreme Court. Um, also by the legal expert Alan Dershowitz. So arguably 24 became kind of the groundwater of accepting the use of, particularly of torture in interrogation. <coughs> arguably, and I'm making, I'm, I'm doing a little bit of shorthand in what's a large, much larger argument. I could show you many representations of this kind. Even after the scandal of Abu Ghraib, where pictures that were intended for other US American soldiers of soldiers torturing Iraqi detainees at the prison um, Abu Ghraib, even after that scandal occurred, and there was a lot of extremely negative discourse going on about US American anti-terrorist um, messages, there was still, I would say, a cultural acceptance of torture that we see in many post 9-11 texts and see in other phenomena, such as John Galliano's 2008 menswear show. I would argue that the, um, the semiotics here, that there are clear references to Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo, and those images of hooded prisoners, detainees being taken places, and this extremely, um, you could say, bizarre and disturbing juxtaposition of a normatively beautiful, hairless male body that has been tortured. I want to make the argument that what I call post-post-9-11 representations of the United States, its security meth uh, methods, and the aftermath of the September attacks and the September attacks themselves are more critical or demonstrate a self-consciousness about the security me uh, measures that were part of US American policy after the attacks as well as the curtailing of civil liberties. They often consciously critique the representational strategies of 9-11 texts. Uh, the, one of the texts I'm going to talk about, Homeland, often in its visual echoes aspects of 24 as a way of implicitly criticizing them. They are marked by an increased self-consciousness about the use of drones, the effects of surveillance measures, the effects of torturing terrorist suspects, as well as an awareness of the public relation aspects of what are viewed as inhumane, if not illegal, anti-terrorist measures. And further, I want to argue that both of the texts that I'm talking about use unreliable narration and narrators as a way to perform a kind of political critique. First text I'd like to talk about is Moshin Hamid's The Reluctant Fundamentalist. Uh, the text plays with us in a number of ways. This is a uh, Pakistani author who spent a fair amount of his life in the United States and in Britain, was extremely successful, went to Prist Princeton and to Harvard, and then worked for the McKinsey um, firm and was quite successful. And aspects of his life are very close to the protagonist of his second novel, The Reluctant Fundamentalist. And there's a play of that about perceptions of the author and perceptions of the protagonist, and also about stereotypes, both of fundamentalists, of terrorists, and of Americans. 
Okay, we had um, a bit of mess up moving the PowerPoint from here to there, but I'll read to you. Um, the novel consistently subverts reader expectations. It is a novel about the loss of belief in the American dream. Uh, the protagonist, Changé, comes as an extremely enthusiastic scholarship student, star soccer player to Princeton, uh, gets an enormously important job well, and numeratively interesting job after his graduation and um, is involved with a normatively beautiful American woman. Um, it is about the loss of faith and the loss of belief in that American dream as it moves from being a novel of immigration and assimilation to one of emigration as we hear about why the protagonist moved back to Pakistan. The title, The Reluctant Fundamentalist, challenges Western expectations about Arabs, Pakistans, and fundamentalism. The fundamentalist here is not the protagonist, Changé. It is more the fundamentalism at the issue um, of US capitalism, specifically that that is practiced by Changé's former employer, Underwood Sampson, whose motto, as they do their pitiless bit for globalization, is focused on the fundamentals. It is an assessment firm that then leads to the dismemberment of firms all over the world. The, a number of formal elements contribute to the instability of the narrative and the way that it surprises us, our reader expectations. Among these are names. Changé is in love with a woman named America who uh, leaves him because she is still in love with her now deceased former lover, Christopher, Christopher Columbus. Uh, Changé can either be read as change or in relationship to Genghis Khan. Changé is the Ordu name for Genghis, as in Genghis Khan, it is the name of a warrior, and the novel plays with the notion of a parallel between war and international finance. It's here that the fundamentalism is which is Changé's occupation. But at the same time, the name cautions against a particular reading of the novel. Genghis attacked the Arab Muslim civilization of his time, so Changé would be an odd choice of name for a Muslim fundamentalist. In fact, Changé is something of a secular nationalist and not particularly religious. Um, this is the opening again. Things have moved around due to the interesting particularities of technology and moving from one um, computer to another. This is the opening of the novel. I'll do my best. Um, it describes Changé's disenchantment with the American dream. I was, I must admit, overly generous in my initial assumptions about the standard of the student body. He's talking about Princeton. They were almost all intelligent and many were brilliant, but whereas I was one of only two Pakistans in my entering class, two from a population of over 150 million souls, mind you, the Americans faced much less daunting odds in the selection process. A thousand of your compatriots were enrolled 500 times as many, even through, though your country's population was only twice that of mine. As a result, the non-Americans among us tended on average to do better than the Americans. And in my case, I reached my senior year without having received a single B. Um, his sense of disenchantment with Americans also to extends to the rudeness of young American men who treat uh, older men in foreign contexts as though they are servants who uh, appear to be entitled all the time. The narrative form is most particularly interesting and makes the narrate, narration not only unstable but also the narrator appear unreliable. It is written as a dramatic monologue or as a you narration. It picks up with Changé. We hear only his voice meeting an American at a cafe in Lahore and in a way mimicking the situation of taking that person hostage, talking to him and talking to him and it's through his perceptions that only that we get to know the American. 
and stereotypes of Americans are evoked. For instance, this man looks like he belongs to the army, both from his bad suit from Des Moines to his short haircut to his muscular body that suggests he lifts weights to the fact that he has a bulge under his jacket suggesting that he is uh, perhaps a CIA operative and his nervousness as he looks at Changé and at the waiter of the cafe looking at, or as though he's anticipating an attack. The author writes that he changed the narration of his novel seven times. The dramatic monologue form that I finally decided on allowed me to capture the way in which the world sees itself today in a sense of mutual suspicion. It almost mimics the global media where so often you hear one side of the story. My novel is written in a form that takes the reverse side of the media. It hands the content over to the reluctant fundamentalist. It is equally biased. The American never gets a word in. The reader has to realize, though, that the novel is only a version of the truth. Numerous hints are given throughout the novel that Shanjay is not entirely a reliable character, as he embellishes story, goes back and forth, etc., etc. The narrative is, and the narrator is unreliable. It works through a you narration. It is also a thriller. It leaves the ending open so that we don't know if the voiceless American is there to murder Changé, who is now working as an instructor at the university, and who, who has had one student who has been accused of being in a plot against the United States and who has been rendered or has vanished. We don't know if Changé, although I believe we doubt it, is actually there to lure the American operative into an operation against him. Some intertextual references strengthen this idea we have Washington Irvin's short story, The Legend of Sleepy Harbor Hollow, which is inv invoked in the last chapter of the novel, suggesting that it could be a headless American, like the infamous um, Berg video that occurred after um, the Abu Ghraib um, scandal, that he could be leading the American into being a headless American and to Joseph Conrad's novella, Heart of Darkness, though we don't know who is the Marlowe and who is the Kurtz, who is waiting for whom. Again, our expectations are subverted and there is no closure. In an earlier scene from the novel, um, Changé describes to the American, much to the anger of the American, how he experienced the attacks from a hotel room in Manila the following evening was supposed to be our last visit in Manila. I was in my room packing my things. I turned on the television and saw what I first took to be a film. But as I continued to watch, I realized that it was the fiction, not fiction, but news. I s stared as one and then the other of the twin towers of New York's World Trade Center collapsed, and then I smiled. Yes, despicable as it may sound, my initial reaction was to be remarkably pleased. He then moves into being worried about his girlfriend Erica of calling and then experiencing what it was to be experience Arab racism after the attacks. When he goes back through New York, he is detained at the airport for hours, the only one of his company because of his Pakistan background. He is also then made the victim of anti-Arab uh, violence. When Shanje is working in New York, doing his job and making good money, this is from an interview with the author, any attachments to his Pakistani Muslim identity are easily manageable. But when suddenly he feels that those worlds are in conflict, those latent tribal identities well up inside him and shatter the veneer of being a global cosmopolitan citizen. When you come to the United States, if you have a Pakistani passport, you spend five hours with questions on whether you have had military training. Students from Pakistan often miss the first semester in college because they don't get their visas in time. There are first order and second order citizens in our globalized world, and although we interact at offices and dinner parties as equals, we're not treated as equals. So the protagonist goes from experiencing what it is to be a global elite 
to being victimized and marginalized as Pakistani and shows this process within the novel and has commented upon it. As a text with an unreliable narrator and a you narrative, such as Moshin Hamid's The Reluctant Fundamentalist, could be read as a writing back to the monologic form of reporting about the Muslim world and terrorism that was intensified after the attacks of September 2001. And I'm quoting from Gavachi Spivak, a very well-known term in post-colonial studies of a writing back of the formerly colonized mimicking the terms of the colonist and throwing them back at them. That would be one way of reading the novel successfully, I believe. Two, like many unreliable narratives, the text can be understood as implicating its reader in the epistemological and political complications it dramatizes. We, like the American listener, are taken hostage. We don't know whether to trust Changer or not, to sympathize with him or not. The narrative leaves us unsure both about his quality as a person and about what is actually happening with the possibility of multiple endings. But third, and perhaps more importantly, an examination of unreliable in this critical post 9-11 text can involve a larger critique of the hegemonic assumptions that underlie definitions of reliability itself. My second post 9-11 text is Homeland from 2011. The second series has just been shown and it is going on into the present. The third will begin this fall. The series, I believe, displays a self-consciousness about the appropriateness of US American security measures. And this begins with art, its artistic credits, which I'd like to watch with you just now. The point of view shots, so we're inside Carrie's mind. Even the credits display a consciousness of unreliability of the narration and of one of the central protagonists, Carrie Matheson, um, and a consciousness about the appropriateness of U.S. security measures. Um, the rapid cut footage demonstrates, in particularly, the disabling effect that the attacks of September 11, 2001 have had upon her and her subsequent sense that she missed something and was personally responsible, a sense that may be hubristic, a sense that may lead her to uh, take on quite large extra-legal measures in trying to pursue a POW in Iraq whom she believes to have turned terrorist. Homeland's protagonist, Carrie, operates a one-woman total surveillance of former POW Marine Sergeant Nick Brody, who appears to be suffering, we learn through her footage of his home, quite understandably from post-traumatic stress disorder, severe alienation from his wife, and bouts of aggression. The viewer, like Carrie's few colleagues who know about her surveillance mission, she has set up total surveillance of the Brody house other than the garage, uh, including the bedrooms, begins to question the validity of Carrie's thesis that he is, has been turned and is a terrorist in waiting, and indeed to question Carrie's rationality and reliability. Carrie takes an antipsychotic, and her behavior becomes increasingly extreme and paranoid and manic 
as the first season goes on. It is also, as we saw in those credits, about the logic and illogic of, of anti-terrorist measures. I hope you noticed in the footage of the credits Colin Powell's now infamous address to the UN Security Council in 2003 about the alleged weapons of mass destruction, the alleged tie between um, Saddam Hussein and bin Laden that was the justification for the United States entering Iraq. Um, we as viewers begin to question the validity of Kerry's evidence and to feel that Brody and his family have been victimized by her aggressive surveillance measure. But not only Kerry is unreliable, Brody is as well. In subsequent footage, we see Brody changing his narrative of what actually happened to him in Iraq. And just as we've come to trust Brody and doubt Carrie, we learn in a flashback in the episode Crossfire from season one, episode nine, how Brody witnessed Isa's death along with that of 82 other children. And if you wait just a second, I'm going to explain a little bit more. Um, after being a prisoner of war for several years, uh, being tortured repeatedly, Brody is made the English teacher of the leader's son. And this is the first human contact that he's had in a very long time. He grows very attached to the child and then witnesses his subsequent death in a drone attack that was okayed by the vice president and then covered up subsequently. Buy me some and
This is Isis' father. Subsequently, right after this episode, the next scene is we see the vice president not only having authorized the attacks, knowing that a madrasa, a school was there, but also then issuing an, uh, a decree that they should be covered up. Um, my argument is here that the unreliability of, and this is a multi focalized narrative, we see the story both through Carrie and through Brody's eyes, and of the narration itself, provides a critical reflection on the use of drones, the justification of anti-terrorist measures, U.S. allegations that so-called civilian deaths are jihadist propaganda, that people don't really die through the use of drones, and the use of surveillance measure with Carrie constantly watching Brody for about the first half of the first season, and on the use of torture in, a, in an episode called Season. Um, weekend, Carrie's boss doesn't torture a young American woman terrorist. Uh, rather, he talks to her about his sense of being excluded as a boy, as being growing up Jewish in the Midwest, and has his outsider status, and through establishing a sense of commonality, gets her to talk to him. Uh, the plot thickens about this as a and a post post 9-11 text when we realized that Homeland is one of President Obama's favorite shows. And you'll recall that President Obama has authorized the use of drones, uh, in, not only for civilians, but in, uh, for targeted killing in a dimension unknown before him. Um, he told the main actor, while Michelle and the two girls go to play tennis on Saturday afternoons, I go to the Oval Office, pretend I'm going to work, and then I switch on Homeland. Um, this is particularly disturbing when we think that Obama has authorized five ten times as many drones as his predecessor, and as CNN reports, drones may have replaced Guantanamo as the recruiting tool of a choice for militants. And our situation of viewers is very complicated when we see a scene, see a scene like the one we just witnessed, if we've seen actual dead bodies after a drone attack of civilian children. If, and I'm assuming it will, Homeland continues to offer a critique of post 9-11 counter-terrorist measures, including the use of torture surveillance measures, and more recently, the increased use of drones then it may indicate that the United States is no longer in consensus about the need to do, as in 24, whatever it takes to combat terrorist threats. Now, where do I want to go from here? And now I'm going to go into fourth gear with you on the Autobahn because it's hot and um, things have taken a little longer. The looking at the unreliability of these texts leads me to a larger issue, which is looking at unreliable narration and unreliable narrator as a staple of literary studies and what we do this. And the straw man I'm choosing to pick on is a straw woman. It is myself in uh, one of my earlier articles, uh, Reconsidering Unreliability, in which I offer a definition of 
unreliability. Texts with unreliable narrators, like ironic utterances, have a target or victim. The unreliable narrator is revealed as being untrustworthy or fallible, as with third parties who witness an ironical comments being made. And it's not being understood by the addressee. The reader feels drawn into a conspiracy with the speaker. Here, the implied author and those text signals that give the impression of there being a person behind the narrator of a text. The reader recognizes the implicit joke and sees that the narrator is not what she proposes to be. Like a lot of definitions of unreliable narrator, this is rests on an idea of the narrator being untrustworthy or fallible, in some sense as being deficient. But let's think about what that means and the assumption that people in the communicative act are equals and hence have a want to be open and honest with each other. If we look at history, we can see that it demonstrates that attestations of unreliability are consistently made about persons in socially subservient positions. And again, I'm doing this in high gear, and it could be done in a great deal more length or with more evidence. This is from the Philippine colonialist situation. As General Leonard Wood, the first military governor of the Moro provinces, argued the use of harsh disciplinary methods was the only option to establish order and security in the region. There is only one day way to deal with these people, and that is to absolutely be just and firm. The Moros are a class of treacherous, unreliable lot of slave hunters and land pirates. Here, unreliability, the attribution, gives the colonizer the right to be firm. In gender-related contexts, the rabbinic dictum about women's unreliability, variously translated as women are weak-minded or light-headed or frivolous, has been generally understood to point to women's unstable temperament, which will inevitably lead to sexual misconduct unless she is kept under strict control. Similarly, in class-related contexts, in the book that I've just finished revising, there's a huge amount of British texts about the lower orders, so-called lower orders, that criminalizes them, marginalizes them by seeing them as unreliable and hence in need of control and discipline by the upper orders. My point here is that an idea like unreliability, based on what I believe is a Kantian notion about equality between persons in a communicative situation, whether that's a textual situation or a situation outside of the text. But in situations in which there's a severe power imbalance, a may be in the deed to the person's best interest to be unreliable as a way of speaking back or speaking to and speaking against power itself. And now I'm on my last slide. I believe that by looking not only at form, but also at the way we analyze form, and the way often when we analyze form or use traditional, in this case, narratological concepts, we may, in fact, be holding up structures of power and disempowerment. I want to say that we need to look at form, both at the form of texts and their political use, and at our concepts themselves, which are inherently also invested with power. And the issue of looking at form and the politics of form can take us out of another dilemma. That is, in a period of literary and cultural analysis in which we no longer talk about high texts and low texts. We no longer have a sense of a privileged culture. Very often, valuations of texts have to do with how good they are in the sense of do their messages please us? Are they morally right or wrong or immoral? Quoting uh, Chantel Mouffe, whose work on agonistic democracy I enormously admire. In fact, given that we find ourselves today in what Danto calls the condition of pluralism, lacking generally agreed criteria by which to judge art productions, there is a marked tendency to replace aesthetic judgments by moral ones, pretending that those moral judgments are also political ones.
By talking about form and the politics of form, I believe we have a way to talk both about the aesthetics and about the politics of the texts that interest us. Thank you very much.